for today's agenda, what we are going to do is we're going to actually start out with our speaker, and then um, we'll break for lunch, and then during lunch we'll actually conduct our uh, annual meeting. Um, I have the privilege of introducing our speaker, Eli Finkel, uh, Northwestern undergrad from 93 to 97, and after earning his PhD in social psychology at UNC Chapel Hill, he came back here to Northwestern in 2003. Professor Finkel is one of Weinberg's college's most esteemed instructors. His course evaluations are reliably among the strongest in the university. He has won over a dozen awards, recognition for his teaching and mentoring. He is routinely nominated to the faculty honor roll, was a finalist for the Northwestern Weinberg College Award for Excellence in Mentoring Undergraduate Research, and the recipient of the Weinberg College Distinguished Teaching Award. Um, his, and, and that's all a big deal, I can tell you. So, uh, his research interests include initial romantic attraction, interpersonal conflict, and self-control. Uh, in addition to his work at Northwestern, Dr. Finkel has made time to build a very rich and varied life. This past Saturday, he delivered a TEDx talk in Chicago, which he'll talk to you about today. And this past Sunday, he actually had an op-ed piece in the New York Times. I'm not sure if any of you uh, saw that, where he talked about Helicopter Parents, I was reading it very carefully, um, where he discussed the conflict between uh, helping your child and then allowing them to grow um, on their own uh, motivationally, um, et cetera. So um, very interesting article. Next weekend, he's backpacking in the Canyonlands National Park in Utah, and he also just booked a trip to Antarctica. He has a three-and-a-half-year-old daughter and a seventh-month-old son. Please join me, please, in welcoming Dr. Eli Finkel. I am delighted uh, to be here. Uh, so, and also for that very grateful for the very nice introduction. Uh, the topic for today's talk is something in the ballpark of the science of romantic attraction, and I definitely will begin with that. Um, but uh, just about like 10 days ago, I was invited to give a TEDx talk and then uh, really sort of hurried to try to get one together. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll present uh, about 20 minutes on, on initial romantic attraction. If you guys want me to stay on that topic, I'll probably launch into uh, some work that we've done on online dating. But I also want to offer you the option, which I think is probably, probably the better one, of launching into the TEDx talk, which is more about marriage. So, so when we get to the halfway point, we'll, we'll stop and take a vote uh, about where I pivot to from there. Um, okay, so, so uh, one of the things that's interested in me, that's interested me about the, the science of romantic attraction is the extent to which we actually have insight into what it is that inspires us in a romantic partner. And... Um, in, in collaboration with a former graduate student of mine named Paul Eastwick, this is a, he was a graduate student here with me, he's now a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, we've explored this question of, of how much do we really know about our, romantic, um, self, about our romantic preferences, that is, can we be trusted to uh, indicate what it is that we ourselves are looking for in a romantic partner? So when I use the term romantic self-insight, I, I, I'm really asking this question, you know, do we know which qualities in a potential romantic partner will make us happy in a relationship with him or her? It, it's not a trivial question. It's arguably a pretty important question, and, and perhaps it's becoming more important all the time because these days it's quite common for people to date online, and I am an enthusiastic advocate for online dating. But one of the features of online dating, I'm sure all of you know people who have dated online. Uh, maybe some of you are avid online daters, in which case, God bless. Um, but, but one of the features about online dating, if, if you think about a site like Match.com, for example, the way that those sites typically work is you indicate, so for example, this is area code, I think, 60208, you would say, I would like to meet men between ages X and Y within this many miles of area code 60208, right? And you'd have a bunch of profiles pop up. A profile is basically a website. So you get a website and this is, you know, NU grad 73, you know, whatever his, his, uh, his name that he selected for himself, and you get to see his photos and you get to learn a bit, little bit about him. 
Um, and if you know what it is that you want in a partner, maybe you can use that information to distill from the profile, yes, this person is somebody who could be compatible with me. This other guy, like Duke grad, 19 whatever, um, that, you know, who would ever be interested in such a person? So, um, okay, so, so it, is, it is important for us to uh, uh, know whether we can trust our romantic self-insights. So, when we tried to figure out this question, it might seem like a straightforward question, but there's actually a few different ways you can think about whether you really know what it is that you're looking for. And one model from the 1970s about how relationships develop is that there are three stages. The, the first stage is what you might call awareness. So this is something like what you might see in online dating. You see a profile, and now I'm aware that NU grad whatever exists. Does he know that I exist? No, probably not, but I am at least cognizant that the person exists. In, in, a, you know, in a not online dating context, this could be you're at a party and you see someone across the room or your friend says, hey, I know a guy and this is what he's like. These are all awareness stage processes. The second stage is surface contact. This is now you've actually met someone, right? So this is now you're interacting with somebody at a party or you're on a first date. Uh, or you've had some type of surface level contact, but you certainly haven't started a relationship together. You're very far from close. That's the third stage. The third stage is, stage is called mutuality. And the idea is now we've actually gotten to know each other a little bit. We've confided a little bit in each other. We're getting a sense of what you're like, what I'm like, how we interact together. And so we can ask this question about a romantic self-insight at, at all of these stages. So I want to talk a little bit about the science of how this sort of research happens, right? So there is a broad range of research paradigms that people like me, right, social scientists, use to try to answer these questions. For example, one thing that happens all the time is that we ask people about hypotheticals. What we say is, what are you looking for in a partner? That's not about any one particular person. That says, if you could like create your ideal man, create your ideal woman, what would he or she look like? Or you get a profile and you say, is that, you know, or a hypothetical profile and you say, is that a good person for you? You could also get photographs. You could say, you know, who's more attractive, who's more attractive, this person or this person, right? That's another way that you can talk about, it's at the awareness stage, you've never actually met the person, but you can use research methods to show how people respond. There's also personal ads, which I talked about before, and online dating. Th these are the sorts of paradigms that scholars often use to discover what people's preferences are. And here's something that's important. Is it the case that your preferences when you talk about a hypothetical partner, or you talk about somebody you, you've met through an online dating context, or you see people in a photograph, can you trust that judgment to predict what will happen when you have met a flesh and blood partner in person, right? And, um, and this is relevant to the online dating context because if your preferences when looking at profiles don't align at all with what you actually prefer face to face, you're wasting your time when you're browsing profiles. I should say one other thing before I launch into this. There are extremely robust sex differences, extremely strong sex differences when scholars study the awareness stage. Now I should tell you, the scholars who are studying the awareness stage don't say we are studying the awareness stage. They think they are studying relationships. I do not think that's true. What they're studying is what people think about what it would be like to be in a relationship. And so these paradigms about hypotheticals, about online dating, et cetera, always show the same sex differences. And this will not surprise you at all. Women, more than men, care about earning prospects and ambition. Men, more than women, care about physical attractiveness. These are enormously robust findings in the scientific literature. There, there really aren't uh, any debates about it at this point. What nobody's really noticed until Paul Eastwick and I started delving into this is, yeah, but what happens when you meet a flesh and blood partner? Do you get the same story? Right, so that's what these question marks are about. Are the sex differences there when you actually are talking about happiness with a first date, happiness in a marriage, or what have you? So, from the perspective of my field, right, so this is social psychologist, there is a dominant theoretical paradigm, a dominant way that people in my field go about trying to explain why there are these sex differences in romantic attraction, why women more than men prefer ambition and, and earning prospects, men more than women prefer physical attractiveness. So here's the nature of this dominant theory. It is based in evolution and differential parental investment. The basic, the, the theory, and I should say, I will express some reservations about this later, but this is how the theory goes. Men and women have a different amount of minimum parental investment 
And what that means is it takes a woman at minimum nine to 10 months to create an offspring. How long does it take a man? Nine to 10 minutes? I mean, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily take him that long. And the, and the argument goes that because her minimum investment is so high, she needs to be very, be very careful and, and in an age where women couldn't support themselves, right? So going back uh, literally hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago, women would have certainly benefited from somebody who would help them raise their child, et cetera. So that's why women have evolved to care more about resources. Men really are, look, should look for signs of fertility, right? Actually, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So men's reproductive success is limited by access to fertile mates, right? It's not that easy for a man to get a woman to mate with you, the, the theory goes. And so they should prioritize indicators of fertility. Indicators of the woman's material resources, the theory goes, should be less important. In contrast, Women's reproductive success is limited by access to material resources, so they should prioritize indicators of the ability and the willingness to invest those resources, whereas indicators of the man's fertility status should be less important. Okay, this theoretical perspective, this is the dominant, the most influential theoretical perspective of those, mate, of those sex differences I told you about. It depends upon the sex differences emerging in surface contact and mutuality context, right? If it's only when you're talking about hypotheticals, it's pretty hard to argue that that was evolutionarily adaptive, right? That, that you know, people passed on their genes if they thought they wanted something that they didn't actually want, right? So it's a little dubious. Now, the reason why I, I am occasionally popular on campus is because I sometimes run speed dating events for our undergraduates for the love of science. And, <laughs> And, and um, for those of you uh, familiar with the, the Norris University, University Center, we run these in the Dittmar Art Gallery, which is right on the other side of Starbucks. Um, and, and I am see these events, right? And, and the basic idea here is, for those of you who aren't that familiar with speed dating, these were all, uh, I'll, the, the events I'll tell you about today are all heterosexual events. So you imagine a, a guy goes speed dating, let's say his name is Dave, and he's going to go on a speed date. And what that is, is have a four minute interaction with each of the opposite sex people there. So he goes on the first speed date, and then the MC, I in this case, blow the whistle, says your four minutes are done, rotate to the next person, and then you, uh, and then you go on these four minute mini dates with each opposite sex person there. So I've gone on a date with all the women, all the women have gone on a, a date with all the men. And this method is neat because what it allows you to do, and this is what we did, is it allows you when people sign up for the event, 10 days before they actually attend the event, we can say, what is it that you're looking for? What characteristics are truly important to you? And what do we find? What everybody else finds. So call Northwestern students weird in any way, shape, or form, but they're not weird in this way. The women, relative to the men, said they wanted ambitious, high-earning people. The men, relative to the women, said they wanted physical attractiveness. Now, of course, everybody prefers a, a, an attractive person over an ugly person or, or an ambitious person over a slothful, you know, live with my mom forever person. But, but are there sex differences there? The answer for this 10 days earlier questionnaire is yes. Women at Northwestern, these are undergraduate, high achieving, intelligent women with big career ambitions, prefer ambition and earning prospects in a man more than the man prefers it in the woman and vice versa for uh, physical attractiveness. So our exact sample of people show those sex differences that everybody else shows. But what we can do that other people somehow never got around to bothering to do is say, okay, you just told us what you care about in a partner. Now let's introduce you to 12 different opposite sex people, potential romantic partners in every case. You rate them on the degree to which they're physically attractive, the degree to which they have high earning prospects, also uh, other characteristics, the degree to which they're kind hearted, for example. How strong are those things as predictors of your overall romantic interest? And so here's what we see 10 days earlier. Women, I told you this before, men more than women say they want a hottie. Uh, women more than men say they care about earning prospects. You'll see everybody at this stage, I mean, they're going speed dating, right? But people care more about physical attractiveness than they care about earning prospects at this stage. And everybody wants somebody personable, somebody nice and friendly and warm, right? And there's n generally, there's never been sex differences on the degree to which people want that. Everybody wants a warm partner or says they want a warm partner. But now let's pivot to actual mate preferences. And what I'll show you here is the correlation between how much you rated that the man, that this particular man has a certain trait, is physically attractive, has high earning prospects, what have you, and 
your level of overall romantic interest in him. Are you following this? I'll, I'll sort of walk you through this as I go, right? This is physical attractiveness. And what do you see? You see this is considered to be a moderate to large effect such that men and women like attractive partners over unattractive partners. But what you should see there is those bars are about the same. There is no difference, and when you do the hypothesis test, there is nothing anywhere close to a statistically significant difference. It is safe to conclude from these data, for, for this particular study, at least for these Northwestern undergraduates, who told us earlier that they cared differentially about earning prospects or physical attractiveness, now there is no difference. Earning prospects, in general, people, uh, you know, this is now a small to medium size effect. In general, Northwestern students tend to be more attracted to people who have good earning prospects and are highly ambitious over people who have bad earning prospects and aren't ambitious. But those effect, that effect is not particularly huge. Of course, at Northwestern, everybody's reasonably ambitious, so that might be part of the reason why it's not a huge effect. But the more important thing is there is no difference between men and women in how much they are inspired by the degree to which that man they just met has high earning prospects, or that woman they just met has high earning prospects, and personability, same thing. On a, on a speed date, it turns out that personability, like having somebody warm, uh, is you know, a medium effect size, um, but men and women care equally, which is what you might have expected. But what does this mean? These are the same people, right? It's not like, well, we had the people who filled out the questionnaire, and then we had the people go speed dating. The people who filled out the questionnaire are the people who went speed dating, and it raises an important question. To what degree do people really know uh, what they're looking for in a partner? And I'm just realizing that I think I postponed that question until later. Let me actually ask it, let me answer a different question. Northwestern University students, how could we possibly generalize from this sample to the world at large? So, we, and we took, that, we took a lot of heat for this because we're really swimming upstream against the dominant theoretical paradigm in our field, right? If it's true that men and women say they have these differential preferences, but when they meet a flesh and blood partner, that preference goes away, well, those people who've built their careers on advocating for ev the evolutionary psychology explanation don't like hearing that. And they came after us pretty hard, right? And so we said, okay, fine, fine, we get it. We need to do something more impressive than what we've done thus far. And so what we did is we did a meta-analysis. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with the term, a meta-analysis is where you seek out every published and unpublished study that has ever been conducted on your topic by anybody anywhere in the world. And there's a variety of things that you do for this. You send out emails to your professional listservs, you scour the various journals. And, and you try to uncover, unearth every single possible finding relevant to your topic, your question of interest. We included all studies that anybody had ever done that looked at a specific person you've met face to face, not online dating, not hypothetical, not photographs, not personal ads, someone you have actually met. And then we said the dependent variable here, so the thing we're trying to predict, is some measure of romantic interest. And because now we're not just talking about speed dating, we're not just talking about initial attraction, we're now talking about how happy are you in your marriage, right? The whole range, the whole gamut of different uh, evaluations. We had a whole bunch of different measures that fit romantic evaluation. So early on, it might be romantic liking or attraction. Later, it might be dating satisfaction or marital commitment or trust or intimacy or passion or love, anything that says, I'm into this relationship. This relationship is going well on some reasonable dimension. And then the independent variable, the things we were using to try to predict the level of romantic evaluation is some measure of physical attractiveness, earning prospects, or both. So studies that, that talked about people you've actually met face to face, could be your husband, could be a speed dating partner, whatever, it has to be somebody you've actually met, that had some measure of romantic evaluation and that had some measure of either physical attractiveness or earning prospects or both. That was eligible for our study and we included everything. By the way, one other neat sort of methodological point here is if you look into this literature, you actually get a bunch of different types of measures, right? So for physical attractiveness, it could be my report of how attractive you are, it could be your report of how attractive you are, or it could be like there was a photo taken of you and 10 independent observers rated how attractive you are, right? And, and you can get this also for you know, my assessment of your income or your earning prospects, objectives assessments, et cetera. So we, and, and I should just cut to the chase here, it doesn't matter. The results I'll show you are the same, whether I'm reporting on how good looking you are or how good your earning prospects are, whether you're reporting it or whether we have an objective measure of those factors. Now, for physical attractiveness, we were able to find 97 studies with a total of 29,000 participants, 29,000 people. 
Earning prospects, we were able to find 56 studies, but some of them were large, so now we had over 50,000 people. So collectively, we have something like 80,000 observations right now, and no, we, now we're talking all over the world, not just college students, not just young people, right? All over the world, totally broad range of samples. What did we find? Physical attractiveness. A moderate to large predictor of romantic evaluation, that is satisfaction in, in the marriage or whatever else it is, but it is equally strong for men and women. There is no difference in the effect size for men and women. That is, men and women are equally happy, or happy in their relationships as a function of the degree of, hap of physical attractiveness of their partner. What about earning prospects? Well, this one's smaller. Turns out that you know, if, if you're trying to figure out what is it that's likely to predict how happy you are in, in your marriage, that the income of your spouse probably is less strongly associated than you might have thought. But regardless of that, that wasn't the question that was of primary interest to us. The question of primary interest to us was, do women actually, are women actually happier in the relationships with wealthy men than men are in the relationships with wealthy women? And the answer is no, just the same. Now, this is a pretty universal finding. If you end up with 80,000 observations, you can look at all sorts of things, like what about this situation or that situation? And so we did. So these effects didn't differ. These null effects, these non-differences between men and women didn't vary as a function of how serious the relationship was, the duration of the relationship, has it lasted four minutes or 40 years, um, the age of the participants. So you easily could have hypothesized that, well, of course, college students don't know what they're looking for, but people by the time they're 50 surely have a sense of that, but there was no difference. Um, the sample type, whether it was a university sample or a community sample, the country, right? So I actually thought in advance it was possible that you might see stronger links or, or, or stronger sex differences in, in more Eastern cultures than in Western cultures. We tend to play up the love stuff, and so maybe we get so swept up in the emotions that everything else goes out the window, but co other cultures might be a little more strategic about these things and adhere more closely to what their theories about what they want are. Not so, it's no differences across countries. Whether the, pu the data were from published or unpublished studies, the year of publication, there's just, no dif there's just no difference, right? So when you look at sex differences, there is a robust whopping set of sex differences, uh, a, a, a set of findings upon which people have scaffolded a huge evolutionary model of the human mating psyche, it doesn't extend to when people have met face to face, either just initially or in longer term relationships, right? So it looks like men and women are about the same on that front. This is troubling for the evolutionary perspective. Is it troubling for the belief that people have accurate self insight, right? So that's sort of the big picture question that interested us. I've been talking about sex differences thus far. And the reason why sex differences are interesting is because people say they have these different preferences, but in reality, you don't see them when people meet face to face. But what if we ignore sex differences for a moment and we instead say, you as an individual, if you say you care more than your best friend does about a certain trait, how funny a man is, let's say, is it in fact true that you're really inspired by the funny men and really turned off by the not funny men and your, your friend who says, I don't really care that much about sense of humor, that's not a big deal to me, is less inspired by how funny a man is, right? This is a different question because it's not about sex differences, right? So ignoring sex differences, do people who believe they value a certain characteristic actually value it more than others do, right? Than people who say they don't care about that characteristic. And so this is a question about, this is technical phrase here, but about stated actual correspondence. Is what you say you want correlated with what you actually pursue when you confront a romantic opportunity? So here is, um, this is going back to our speed dating data, but I, I'll get to some other data in a little bit. So here we have, um, on the x-axis here, we've plotted from low physical attractiveness partner to high physical attractiveness partner. So you have just met a man and you've said, on a scale from one to nine, he's like a three. That would be sort of down here. Or on a scale from one to nine, he's like an eight or a nine. That would be up here. And then what we're, and this is your overall level of romantic interest. So for the people who said, this is a collapsing across men and women because it didn't make any difference whether you were a man or a woman. And I mean, it makes a difference whether you're a man or a woman in all sorts of cases, but not with regard to these data. So. Here's the deal. Let's say you are somebody who says, I care a lot that the person I'm with is attractive. You told us 10 days earlier that you care a lot. Your findings are consistent with that. What it shows is when you rated the guys as pretty unattractive, your level of romantic interest was pretty low. But look at the steeply positive slope. As you rated him, as, if you rated the particular guy as extremely attractive, your level of romantic interest went, was way higher. That's consistent with the idea that you know what it is that you're looking for. You say you care a lot about looks, and in fact, you really much prefer the good-looking as opposed to the less good-looking people. But let's look about 
let's, let's think about people who said, I don't care that much. Looks aren't that important to me in a mate. You should have seen something like this. That is, maybe it's still the case that people who say, I don't care that much, would prefer somebody who's attractive to somebody who's unattractive, but the slope should be less steeply positive, right? That's what it means to say, I don't care that much about physical attractiveness. But that's not what the data looked like. This is what the data looked like. So yes, if we want to give you credit, if you're somebody who says, I care a lot about how good looking partners are, correct the mundo, nice job, you do care a lot. It just so happens you care precisely the same amount as somebody who says, I don't care at all. And what if we look at earning prospects? That's what, the, that's what it looks like, two exactly parallel lines. That is, the degree to which the man has low versus high earning prospects is exactly as strongly associated with your level of attract, overall attraction to him. As regardless of whether you said that's totally important to me or totally unimportant to me, it makes no difference. And this is personable and it's the same thing again. Now, we did a quirky little extra study because what we want to say is that romantic self-insight is particularly difficult. Romantic relationships are enormously complicated. People are difficult to break down into their constituent traits, right? We experience people as whole collections of various traits and characteristics and qualities, and it's not easy to extricate or extract this quality or that quality. And we wanted to say that's the problem. But there's another explanation that's consistent with the findings that I've shown you, which is we never have any clue what we want under any circumstance. <laughs> so we did a silly study where we asked people, how much do you like sugary cereals? And then we had them rate the degree to which they actually enjoyed a whole bunch of cereals. That varied in the sugar content. I know that seems ridiculous. That is exactly analogous to what we had done with the romantic case. How much do you care about physical attractiveness? Then you met a bunch of people who varied in their physical attractiveness. This time, it's sugar. And you get exactly what you should have seen in all these other graphs, which is that people who say, I got to tell you, I love sugary cereals, in fact, like the sugary cereals more than the non-sugary cereals. That's the black line here. But the red line is people who say, I don't really care that much about how much sugar is in my cereal. And in fact, what you see is they don't care very much. That is, as the cereal goes from lower sugar to higher sugar, their level of liking for the cereal doesn't really vary. Okay, one last thing I want to show you. These are undergrads. It could easily be the case that they just don't know their preferences yet. So what about older people, not students? And what if one is already in a relationship with a partner? It's not just a speed dating initial attraction context. This is somebody that you've already developed a, a, a potentially serious relationship. And so let's look at actual correspondence again, but this time in a different sort of study. We ran another study where we had, uh, we recruited 500 uh, adults. This time um, they were adults with a wide variation in age. On average, they were 41 years old. And the procedure was at intake, at the beginning of the study, romantically unattached participants reported on their mate preferences. So these are people who are single at the beginning of the study, but interested in meeting people. And we, they tell us, how much do you want a whole range of characteristics? It wasn't just earning prospects and physical attractiveness and personability, but now it's political orientation and how, I forget, a whole range of different characteristics. And then about two or three years later, we followed up with them and said, hey, are you seeing somebody? And about a third of our sample was actively involved in a romantic relationship, and we said, okay, great. Tell us about that person. What, you know, to what degree does that person have the qualities, have these sets of qualities? And we could compare that to what they said two years earlier. For those of you who weren't, those people in the sample who weren't seeing somebody, we said, okay, report on the person you're most interested in. And again, we could look at, at the correspondence between what you said years ago that you were interested in and uh, the degree to which this person has those qualities today. And we looked here at romantic interests, the sorts of things I was showing you before, but also marriage intentions. So this is not speed dating anymore, right? These are grown-ups who are dating usually with a purpose. Uh, marriage intentions, and some of them were actually engaged or married, so we looked at marital status too. Is it the case that you are more likely to be engaged with somebody two and a half years later if that person's qualities aligned with what you said you cared about at the beginning of the study when you were single? I don't want to walk through everything. Let me just say we got this 21 times. What this means is that regardless of whether we're predicting romantic attraction or intentions to marry or actual marital status, and regardless of whether the quality in question is physical attractiveness or earning prospects or political perspective or what have you, people who say they care a lot about a given quality don't care any more about that quality when it comes to decisions including whether to get married than people who say they didn't care very much. Let me conclude here. 
Are there sex differences? Yes, of course there are sex differences. Everybody finds them all over the place. Once you start bothering to study people looking at flesh and blood partners, though, those sex differences go away. Do we have accurate self-insight? Sadly, we do not seem to have accurate self-insight about specific qualities we're looking for. I should say the story is very slightly more complicated because we tend to be sort of okay under some circumstances at like rank ordering a whole range of qualities. I care more about this quality than that quality. So if you do that across 30 or 40, we're a little better at figuring out relative to somebody, you know, being a good boxer, I care that, you know, he's actually a good golfer or something, right? You can sort of do that a little bit, but that's not what we do when we ask people what they're looking for. We ask them to list traits, specific characteristics or qualities that that are particularly important and they don't know what they're talking about. So when you try to set somebody up, don't listen. <laughs> all right, that's all I got. Um, so here I am, I've got, uh, from here, I, uh, why don't I let you help me decide? So I could either take some questions or comments about this, and also I could put it to a vote if you guys wanna hear a little bit about online dating or a little bit about the marriage hack. Do you, and, and what do you prefer? I think that is the more fun one. So, so let's do that. And do I, I have eight, it's an 18 minute talk. Do I have 18 minutes? Okay, great. Okay, so this is something. Okay, so I'll take questions about both talks at the end. So this is something that will feel different to you. That last talk that I gave is a scholarly talk. It's a talk that's really, you know, research-based. The talk I'm about to give now is also research-based but it was built to be a TED style talk. I gave it at TEDx U Chicago on Saturday. It was a very stressful experience because I got about a week to prepare it. And think about what would happen to you if somebody said, we would like you to give a TED talk. For those of you unfamiliar, this is, the motto is ideas worth spreading. You get 18 minutes to say something profound, go. I was freaked out, but, but long story short, I came up with something that I think is not totally horrendous, and I'm sort of excited about it, so, so I'd like to share it with you. But you'll notice that the flavor of this talk is a different type of presentation than what I just had before, because that was the sort of thing I would give at a conference. This is the sort of thing that I would give if there's a chance I would end up on at TED.com with like 20 million views, which is unlikely. But at least I'll have like 100 views, and that's good enough for me. Okay, so now I wanna, uh, I'm gonna pivot now. I wanna talk about marriage. And I should say, when I use the term marriage, I'm actually using it in the sense of a long-term committed marriage-like relationship, even if it isn't technically marriage. And what I, will, uh, what I will do is introduce you to a procedure that my collaborators and I, and I have developed, procedure that my collaborators and I have developed, um, that has a pretty strong potential of helping you sustain high marital quality over time. And I will try to convince you by the end of the talk that spending the 21 minutes that it requires to use our procedure is perhaps the best investment you'll ever make in your life. Is this already starting to sound a little different? Okay, but first let's get on the same page about some background stuff. What's that? Okay, yeah, start writing. So, so um, this slide, I know that you may not be able to see it because of the way that the, um, the sun is, but this is we blinked. And what I mean by that is we, as people in America, and as social commentators, we missed something fundamental that's happening to the nature of human sociality. So we focused our attention on bright, shiny developments like the advent of social networking sites and, and online dating sites, like, you know, I've been interested in that. But we missed something far more fundamental, which is that the size of our social networks, and by social networks, I'm now talking about intimate social networks, people truly close to us, is shrinking rapidly. And what's happening is we're emphasizing more and more and more the specific relationship of our marriage partner. Let me show you some data that that's, uh, I think support this. In 1985 and, and 2004, this is not ancient history, right? This is a 19 year gap that happened pretty recently. Americans, a large sample of Americans were asked this question. Looking back over the last six months, who are the people with whom you've discussed matters important to you? Another way of stating that question is, who are your close confidants, right? And let me show you a little bit about what's happening. This here that I'm plotting is change from 1985 to 2004 in terms of percent. And this is, what I'm showing you here is what percentage of Americans said that they had at least one friend who was a close confidant, or one sibling, or one coworker, or one co-member of a group, or one neighbor? And the answer is, so many fewer than 19 years earlier. So the reduction 
From 1985 to 2004, in the number of people who say, or the percentage of Americans who say they have at least one confidant in each of these social categories, went down 30 to 60%. Let me put flesh on those bones for you. So, for example, what percent of Americans in 1985 said, I have a close confidant who is a co-member of a group with me? 26.1%. By 2004, that number had plummeted to 11.8%. How about neighbors? In 1985, 18.5% of Americans listed a neighbor who was a close confidant. By 2004, 19 years later, that number had plummeted to 7.9%. Here is in contrast what's happening with marriage, right? More and more and more of us are saying that my marriage partner is a close confidant. Let me actually, I, and, and by the way, when I say we blinked and we missed this, I do not hear people talking about this. This feels like it is an absolutely gigantic social trend that we as a society and the social commentariat, we've largely missed. And what I think is happening is that we are increasingly emphasizing the importance of this one bond, the marriage relationship above all other sorts of relationships. And let me, and I haven't seen much social commentary about this, but this is a quote from Elizabeth Gilbert. Anybody know who she is? The author of... Eat, pray, love. Yeah, she's most known for that. She has a quote that I liked. I actually think it was a sophisticated insight into what's happening with marriage these days. It's not enough that you have this sort of decent relationship with this person. He also has to be your best friend. He has to be your only romantic partner. He has to be somebody who inspires you every day. He has to be somebody who is going to help your career. He has to be somebody who co-parents with you. He has to meet you on 25 different levels of intersection. And I think it's true that we are asking more and more and more of this one of this one social bond relative to all these other social bonds. Is that a good or a bad thing? I'm leaving that for another day. That's not the focus of this talk. But what I want to say is the marriage hack, this procedure that I think is pretty effective at helping people improve their marriage, would have been useful 25 years ago or 50 years ago or 100 years ago, but it is increasingly essential today. Right? As we put more and more of our eggs in this one basket, it's more and more important that we have a high relative to a low quality marriage. And look, let's face facts, Having a high relative to a low quality marriage has always mattered, right? So in terms of marital quality, for example, you probably think that uh, the amount of satisfaction you have with your financial circumstances is a strong predictor of your overall life satisfaction or the satisfaction with your physical health or with your friendships or with your career, and you'd be right. All of those things are important predictors of our overall life satisfaction, how happy we are in general, but the marriage, how happy you are in the marriage, is twice as powerful a predictor of your overall life satisfaction as satisfaction with health or career or what have you. And it's not just predicting your happiness. It's actually a pretty strong predictor, in some cases an extremely strong predictor, of your overall mental and your physical health. Let me present to you the results of one study. This is a study um, published in 2001. And what they did in this study is they recruited 200 congestive heart failure patients and their spouses. And they coded at the beginning of the study the extent to which you have a high quality or a low quality marriage. And they compartmentalized the, the sample into people who had a high quality marriage and people who had a low quality marriage. And then they followed them over time. And what I want to show you in this graph is who was dead two years later. This is actual mortality, right? You might think social science, those are sort of namby-pamby measures. This is death. It's a good study with a really like pretty impressive dependent variable, right? What you see for the people who were categorized at the beginning of the study as having a high quality marriage, 16% of them had died. These are, at the end of the day, congestive heart failure patients, right? They don't necessarily have long lifespans, although there's high variability, of course. 16%. What about the low quality marriage people? 45%. 45% of the congestive heart failure patients were dead two years later if they had a low quality marriage. Stated otherwise, if you are a person with congestive heart failure, you are about three times more likely to be dead two years later if you have a high quality rather than a low, I'm sorry, a low quality rather than a high quality marriage. So that's arguably good news depending upon the nature of your marriage. Let me also, um, let me introduce you to some potentially bad news. This is the trajectory of marital well-being over time. And this is one study, but I could show you a range of studies. So this is the newlywed era. This measure is marital happiness, and this is plotting 50 years, a pretty impressive study. And there's a broad range of, of studies that show generally the same point. Do we realize that our marriages are getting a little less good all the time? Often we don't. We misremember the past. It's okay, maybe it's not so great, but it used to be terrible, right? You sort of convince yourself, like, oh, it's, it's 
still going up. It's getting great. But, but the evidence is, on average, I can't speak about any one of your marriages, and I'm sure every one of your marriages totally defies this trend. <laughs> but on average, your marital quality, marital quality goes down over time. And what was sort of sad to me when I delved into this literature is I thought, well, of course, there's like a honeymoon period of a couple years that's, that's really like artificially happy, and then you sort of settle into a stable uh, trajectory after that. Not so. It goes down at least for the first 50 years, which is all that's been studied, which is all that's been studied thus far. But luckily, we live in the 21st century. And at this point, scientists have been delving into human social psychology for a long time, and we have a lot of insights into what it is that can help make marriages better or worse. The problem here is that when people think about intervening in marriage, they tend to have it exactly wrong. The logic tends to be that when we think about intervening in marriage, we think about marital therapy. When we think about marital therapy, we think about, good heavens, this marriage has been unsatisfying to both of us for a very long time, and now one or both of us is thinking we might actually have to get divorced, seek out help. Not unreasonable, right? That's probably a good time to get help. help. Um, but by that time, you have some pretty nasty interpersonal habits, and there's a lot of scar tissue, hurt, and anger, and it's pretty hard to reverse that freight train once it's already going that way. It's not impossible, and I don't mean to be discouraging. But the right way to think about intervening in marriage is the opposite. It's not when things are so bad that we might actually have to divorce that you should say, what can we do to make this marriage better? It's when things are so good that you say, I feel pretty lucky to be involved in this relationship. Can we sustain this for the long run despite the fact that most marriages aren't able to do it? That is the time to intervene. Or in the words of JFK in his 1962 State of the Union address, the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining. Now he was talking, he was talking about the economy. It applies also to your marriage. And frankly, also probably to your roof. <laughs> so now what is this marriage hack? I'm using this term marriage hack. So some of you, might be familiar with this new term that's come out over the last five, 10 years called a life hack. The idea of a life hack is it's a quick and dirty workaround type solution to a big problem. It's not necessarily the most elegant or the most efficient solution. What it is, is it's a solution that's easy and it works, right? Same idea with the marriage hack, right? So I don't think anybody's used the term before, but I mean the term in that sense. Is there, there's a big problem that we're trying to solve, which is in general, marital quality goes down. Is there some sort of quick and dirty workaround solution that we can develop to prevent that, to sustain high, quality, uh, uh, marital, high marital quality over time? So we focused on conflict in marriage. Now, I don't think conflict is the be-all, end-all. It's not the only thing that matters in your marriage, to be sure. But it is the most robust, the most reliable predictor of whose marriages are flourishing versus distressed. And so when we came into this and we said, is there anything quick and dirty that we can do to try to help people sustain high quality marriages, we focused on conflict because that seems to be in a large sense where the rubber meets the road. Now, turns out marital researchers, mostly not me, but marital researchers have done a lot of work over the last several decades, really since the 70s, there's been an enormous amount of work showing how we should have conflict, showing that there are certain types of conflict styles that are particularly corrosive and destructive and other types that are particularly constructive and helpful. For example, contempt is bad. Uh, rolling your eyes at your partner, not good. Um, validating your partner's perspective, recognizing that your partner is making concerted efforts to change, good things. Now, all of you know this, and the reason why you know this is because you are not currently in a fight. It's easy to know these things in the abstract, but it is pretty hard to remember to be good all the time in the throes of some anger, right? And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to build an intervention, a marriage hack, if you will, where the focus was Let's get these people a little bit of psychological distance, right? Let's not th let them get so consumed in the moment of the conflict that they forget how to fight nicely. They forget, wait, there's a lot of good in the relationship too. And so that was the nature of what we tried to build. We got some funding from the National Science Foundation. I was able to recruit a, an all-star team of, of collaborators. Uh, Erica Slaughter and Laura Lukies were grad students here. They're now professors also, but they were grad students with me. And Greg Walton and James Gross are professors at Stanford. And the four of us worked together to develop a study. What we did is we recruited 120 couples, married couples from the local community here. And these couples filled out long questionnaires every four months. And as part of those questionnaires, they indicated the extent to which they experience 
Uh, I'm sorry, they wrote about the most serious conflict they had experienced in their marriage over the previous four months. Everybody did that. In the second year of the study, we took half of them, we randomly assigned half of these 120 couples to the marriage hack condition. And the only difference between the, the people who stayed in the regular condition and the marriage hack group was that in addition to filling out these long questionnaires, including a discussion of their uh, conflicts, they also wrote for an additional seven minutes during each of the three year two questionnaires. Specifically, what they wrote about, oh, oh, I should tell you, before I tell you what they wrote about, these are sample conflicts. I find these sort of fun to read, so she thought I wasn't listening because I asked her to repeat what she was saying several times. <laughs> and I'm sure like there's more of a story there, but I just, I just read what they type into a text box and it always strikes me as funny. Th this next one is a similar sort of argument, but it's from the perspective of, of the woman who, who wrote it in all caps and I believe was actually screaming it into her keyboard. <laughs> She said, the fact that I don't let him finish his thoughts, i.e. I don't listen to him. Which is funny to read, by the way. Okay, so um, there's also, my husband thinks I should do more exercise. I'm in perfect shape and he keeps saying that I need it. And I grant you, like, I'm all like marriage expert guy and stuff, but I can tell you that any man who's making this mistake is going to have a marital conflict. <laughs> um, my husband messed up the bathroom and denied that he did it. This one cracks me up because I think what the person actually meant is like he was doing some plumbing and then like the water leaked or something, but I like to think he just like had a real gastrointestinal extravaganza and then like walked out and was like, what? I, I, you know. um, navigating sex, she doesn't want to have it. <laughs> this is, um, as, uh, you know, as I'm sure you're not surprised to hear, this is a surprisingly common conflict in marriage. This is another surprisingly conflict one, the way we discipline our children. Um, this guy got very sort of metaphysical about it, to spank or not to spank. Um, anyway, that gives you a sense of the sorts of conflicts that people were reporting. And look, people fight about this stuff. This isn't, you know, aside from the, the, the bathroom thing, which is just funny. I mean, this is the, you know, you're not listening to me. Um, you know, we can't get on the same page about when and how to have sex and how to discipline our children. That's what people fight about, right? And we saw examples like this all over the place. Here's what happens. In the default perspective, when you are having conflict, you see things through your own eyes, right? It is very easy for you to say, you know, I'm being a pretty good person here, but look at all this crap you're doing, right? And I am morally righteous about how good I am relative to that awful stuff you're doing. And that's all well and good, except that your, your sparring partner, in this case your spouse, probably thinks the same thing. And that is not a constructive way to go about conflict, right? And so what we wanted to do is get people into a different sort of, sort of mindset. And so we had them write. This is this extra seven minutes of writing that they did. They wrote th in response to three different prompts. After they wrote, which everybody did, about the conflict, the first thing that they did is they wrote for about two, three minutes about trying to think about the conflict from the perspective of a neutral third party who wants the best for everybody. So again, already you're getting sort of out of the perspective of me looking at you and focusing on what you're doing that's making me so angry to this external perspective where I see us as a couple and I get a sense of like, wow, I'm sort of being petulant and you have a reasonable point. And oh, by the way, we're also a couple and we're married and this isn't what defines our marriage, right? Once you can get out of that mindset. But we didn't only want people to think about this stuff for the past. We wanted them to be in this mindset for the future. And so the second writing prompt was... What obstacles will you confront when trying to adopt this perspective in your, in your marriage going forward? So when you're having conflict, it's often hard to have a third party, neutral, benevolent perspective. Well, why, why do you think that'll be difficult? And people listed their own reasons, but we didn't want them to be pessimistic. So the third and final prompt was, how can you surmount these obstacles? So you just told us why it's gonna be hard for you when you're in the middle of a fight to adopt this neutral, benevolent third party perspective, how can you overcome those problems, right? This is the only difference. So you would have written about two to three minutes about each of these, about seven minutes of total, uh, seven minutes in total, three times over the second year. In all other respects, you're just the same as the other participants. Let me show you what we found. This is sadly what we find for people in the no intervention condition. And oh, by the way, this exactly echoes what we saw earlier. Marital quality tends to go down over time. Right? This is over the course of the two-year study here, so this is the study entry, and this is two years later. And you'll notice that the marriage hack, I already told you, started at the midway point. It is only in the second year of the study. And so what we can do is we can say, those people who were assigned to our special intervention, did they show this downward tra trajectory and what happened to it? And what you can see here is that line, that red line after the marriage hack begins, statistically speaking, is flat. What that means is that in contrast to all the previous research and also the people in our own study who show this pretty reliable decline in uh, marital quality over time, 
In the marriage hack, you sustained that level of quality that you had when you started the marriage intervention. Now, I should also tell you, this is not just a marriage hack, this looks like it's a life hack, because unbeknownst to us, this was sort of an unexpected benefit. Relative to the people in the control condition, the no intervention condition, people who did this extra 21 minutes of writing were significantly less depressed at the end of the study, less stressed, and globally more happy with their lives. And why did this happen? We think what happens is when you take this third party perspective, you're able to be less angry about your conflicts. The conflicts weren't any less severe and they weren't any less frequent, but the amount of anger you had about the conflicts got lower and lower and lower over time. And you can, from this third party perspective, keep track of the big picture of the fact that we have more to our marriage than just this conflict. So last thing, when, should you implement this marriage hack if you're going to implement it? Should it be in the newlywed era or should it be five years in or 15 or 20 or 50 years in? The answer comes from comparing these graphs that I showed you earlier. This is the general 50 year trajectory of marriage, marital happiness. This is what we found in our marriage intervention. What you'll notice is thus far, we have not been able to reverse any downward trend in marital quality that you might have experienced but we can stall the downward trajectory where it is. So the answer, whether you've been married two years or 50 years, is right now. Now is the best time to start, because on average, if your relationship is like other relationships, you will experience slight decrements over time, and we so far haven't figured out a way to reverse those. But as soon as you start the marriage hack, it looks like we can help sustain you at that level of quality, which hopefully will be higher than it would have been otherwise. Um, by the way, I should say again, I tried to tell you at the beginning that I would suggest that this is one of the uh, best investments you could ever possibly make. And so the way I ended my TED talk was in the time that you spent listening to me, you could have been saving your marriage and it's time to get to work. I'm happy to take them about either topic, or really about anything. Yes? Do you have any research on second marriages? I do not have any research on second marriages, um, and I'm not particularly knowledgeable about them, except they're a little bit more likely to end in diver divorce than first marriages. However, both of my parents have been happily remarried for 30-some years, and uh, I've been delighted. But no, I don't, from a scientific perspective, I'm not, there are people who study that, but I don't really know the literature very well. Yes? Um, the idea of what you're doing reminds me a lot of Don Rawls uh, toward the theory of justice, where you want to take, your, if you didn't know who you'd be in a uh, moral dilemma or a moral conflict, you try to take, uh, put on a veil of ignorance and assume that position and, um, and then say, would I still come up with the same resolution? And, and they see, he said, mothers use it all the time. If you have one orange and two kids, you say, okay, whoever cuts it, the other person chooses. And you're going to get that distribution uh, and you made a lot fairer. I like that. Yeah. So. And so I think that I'd also suggest that people read John Rawls, but he's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, I had actually forgotten about that, but you're right. That is, that is very similar. And actually, I'm amazing at doing the, the veil of ignorance. In fact, for me, it's not a veil. Yeah. I have like legitimate ignorance all over. <laughs> so I'm gifted at that. Yeah. Is the decline of, of, of uh, happiness in a marriage, uh, is it related to the idea that, that we now have greater expectations for that marriage, where you Back to those other, that other chart you showed where we're now expecting a lot more of our babies. I think, I think they're related. So, so the, the, rela the, the question is, is some of the reason why we experience a decline in marriage that we have unrealistic unre expectations? And I think the answer is that's, that's likely to be part of it. And that's, that's something I sort of like held aside. I was like, that's a topic for another day, the freighted marriage. Um, it can't explain the two graphs because those gra the 50 year graph predated some of these really recent changes like between 1985 and 2004. But yes, I mean re really if you, wanna, if you wanna go back like not on the order of 20 or 50 years or something, but if you wanna go back a couple hundred years, the major change that's happened in marriage is that love conquered it. And there's actually a good, um, a good book, uh, if anybody's interested, interested called Marriage, A History, How Love Conquered Marriage or something. But the idea is marriage, used to be a sort of political or economic arrangement, and more for better than for worse, it's increasingly, and in, in recent decades, rapidly, become more about love and personal fulfillment and expectations, right? And that quote from the author, from Elizabeth Gilbert, is really specific about what, what am I looking for the marriage? I'm looking to have him do this for me and do this for me and do this for me. Is it the wrong way to think about marriage? I'm not sure. 
But it's asking a lot of the marriage and stuff that we, we never used to ask. In the Middle Ages, uh, you know, hot, passionate sex was, was standard operating procedure, but not with your wife. Right? I mean, courtly love, I mean, you wouldn't want to, like, do that with your wife. It'd be ridiculous, right? I mean, so I, I, I just want to keep in perspective here. And it's important that we realize that, that, that the institution of marriage is a living, breathing thing that across his, historical and also cultural epochs looks really, really different. So we tend to get caught up in, no, marriage is like this, and it's always been like this, and there can't be any other way to do it. And, you know, from a, from a divine perspective, I'm not qualified to answer that. But from the perspective of a social scientist, it is factually false. Yes? This question, do you have any data that talks about the impact of children on marriage? Do I have any data? Should I like show you my own marriage? Um, bad. The, the effect of children on marriage, um, it does not tend to be good. You tend to have a whole lot less sex um, probably even with your like other courtly lover or whatever. Um, there's way less time, honest to God, there's less time. And look, having young children, so I have a three and a half year old and a half year old, who by the way, just learned how to wave. Like two days ago, he learned how to wave and it, literally there's a video, I, I, I've been watching it like 20 times where he's like this. It's like, hi, and he goes, he's, he's very proud of himself. He's just staring at his hand. He's like, look what that does, I, you know? Um, so yes, it, marriage, uh, kids tend to, tend to be troubling for the marriage. There's way less time for the marriage. There is um, a lot more fighting about uh, all sorts of aspects of the domestic sphere and also how many hours people are working away from home and travel. So it is hard. And I encourage everybody who's thinking about having kids or, or knows people who, who are thinking about kids, be tolerant of the challenges that you'll face in your marriage in the short run because it is a hard thing to do. Yes. I liked your expression earlier, let me put some hair on these bones. <laughs> Did I say that? Let me put some hair on these bones? Those are my, the, those are, put some meat? So, I prefer, I, look, I love hairy bones. I was gonna ask you to put some meaty skin. Sure. Not hairy skin. On the bones and kind of do a role play. You um, said in your marriage chat, think about it not with third-party perspective. Yeah. Um, what obstacles are happening over time. Just take an example of somebody's conflict and how, and go through that. Yeah, so the, um, there was one, um, turns out if you have 18 minutes to give a TED talk, there's like 50 million things you try on that, that get it jettisoned to the cutting room floor. There was one that I had, so, so these people fought about money each time. So each time it was like, how I pay the bills, or we're fighting about money. It's loosely the same fight every, every four months. They reported on the same thing. Not an uncommon thing to fight about, by the way. Um, and what did she do? Yeah, so the first time she wrote, trying to adopt a third-party perspective, she said, well, okay, if I adopted a third-party perspective, I'd be able to um, be a little less angry and upset. And I think that was already a, a pretty good way of thinking about it. By the third time she wrote, now, mind you, not everybody wrote about the same conflicts every time, but she did. So by the third time she wrote, she'd now done it two previous times, she wrote, not only I'd be less angry and upset, but then she also wrote that other thing I was talking about, which is, and I would remember that we generally have a good marriage um, and, that we shouldn't let, and that we shouldn't focus so much on, on the conflict. And I think that's the crucial thing that this external perspective gives you. Is, is, and, and I actually mean it almost in a literal, like imagine this in a vision sense of the word, like how you see. So you're staring at something, it's salient to you. It's the thing that's dominant in your mind. And if you and I are in the midst of a fight and I say something not particularly kind to you and you come back with something not, not particularly kind, I'm looking at you as you're doing that mean thing to me. But imagine looking at, at it from a third party perspective. You're looking at two people behaving probably a little bit childishly who probably under other circumstances would actually be able to get along quite well. And I think that's the main thing that this external perspective reminds you of is the conflict isn't all consuming even though it feels like it in the moment. And I should say, one other thing I didn't mention is the marital quality uh, measure that we had was an overall amalgamated measure that included trust and intimacy and, and uh, satisfaction and love. But maybe importantly, it included sexual passion too. And so what's sort of amazing is thinking about conflict from the perspective of a neutral third party keeps you hotter for your partner over time. And that's, talk to any marital therapist, that's like the holy grail. Right? How can we sustain sexual desire and romantic passion for our partner? Turns out that thinking about conflict from this perspective for 21 minutes over the course of a year seems to help to do that. We were sort of surprised that the effect went that far. Um, I'm, I'm happy. Do I still have a couple more minutes? 
Okay, uh, you then you. Yeah. Graph about the thing, your spouse thinking confidence going up and the marriage going down. Is there like? I'm sorry. Say that again. The, the number of people who use their spouse as their confidence. Confident, confident, went yeah, up, yeah. Right? And marriage went down. Is it bad to have your spouse be confident? Is that what I, that, I, part of the reason why I've postponed this? So I'm currently working on an article about this. I, I and, and I thought that my answer was going to be yes, that it's bad. Uh, it, so I, this is a paper that we're calling, and I think I just currently bought the URL, freightedmarriage.com, because I think I might write a book about this. But So the idea is um, we've freighted marriage. That is, we're asking more, and it, we're asking of this one institution, this one relationship, more and more and more than we've ever asked before. And I thought, and that's bad. And now I've, I've come to think, but I'm still really reviewing what's out there, so I, I, I don't know where I'm gonna end up on this. I think that it's probably gonna be the story that it's bad on average, because most marriages can't sustain that level of stress, that level of, of pressure and responsibility, and most of us don't have the spouse who happens to be not only the perfect person to be our sexual soulmate for 50 years, but also our like number one confidant, and also can give us advice about our career, and also an intellectual sparring partner, and it's asking a lot to put that all in one person. And it used to be that, you know, you went to the Elks Club, and you sort of had like jocularity with your friends, and then you came home and had this sort of interaction with your wife, and whatever. It's a different world, right? That's really changing. And so I used to think it was bad. What I think I'm going to get to as I keep reading what's available in the literature is that, that most marriages can't hack it. It's too much to ask of any one marriage and we should try to sustain outside friendships and start belonging to groups. I mean, you guys are the exception. I mean, social organization, involvement in social groups. You guys know the book Bowling Alone? Has anyone heard of that? Has really plummeted in, since the 60s, right? So I think some marriages can do it and it's efficient to have that person be the person who sleeps next to you. So if you happen to be somebody in that lucky position, I think it's probably okay. One last question, yeah. Do, do you factor in aging issues with satisfaction marriage, partner satisfaction marriage? Do you factor in any, any of the aging issues we face uh, with aging? I didn't do that. So, so is the question, so is the question just that we become surly as we get older or something? Like, because I could tell you that's true for me. Um, the, the brief answer is I, I didn't do it here, um, but people have done it. So for example, so, so in the domain of like romantic passion or passionate love, for example, which, which I think is a particularly interesting and difficult topic, right, to, to sustain that within a marriage over the long run, um, They've shown that yes, as people age, their level of sort of romantic passion goes down, and as their relationship is around longer, the romantic passion goes down. So you make the good point that those are sort of confounded. And so what you can do is you can look at, who asked me about second marriages? I think you did. You can look at, okay, so, so there I am, and over the course of 20 years, my passion for my wife went down, and my level of interest in the marriage went down. What happens when I like get involved in a new marriage or a, a new serious relationship? Does my passion sort of spike back up or is it, does it sort of start where it was and continue declining? And the answer is, for the most part, it spikes back up, right? So yes, there's some amount of age level decline, like men, for example, as they get older, have less and less testosterone, which is correlated with sexual passion, for a romantic passion, for example. Um, but it is the novelty of the relationship per se, independent of age, that is crucial. So you know what I'm doing for dinner tonight with my husband. <laughs>